repeatedly beaten and tortured in recent years. The prominent beer critic is one of several reporters who have been violently targeted. Two journalists were killed in the last month, prompting condemnation from the United Nations. Tutor says if beer wants to fix things for Cameroonians, then he should go. For now, the journalist lives in fear. Even the sound of his floorboards creaking, he says, sends him into a panic. Activists and opposition in Uganda have cried foul at the government's decision to close the United Nations Human Rights Office in the country. Amidst condemnations of human rights violations in Uganda, the U.S. mission has pledged further support to the government in promotion of economic growth, strengthening security and fostering democratic values. Godfrey Badebi reports. The Uganda government, through its Foreign Affairs Ministry, took a decision to shut down the U.N. Human Rights Office. A decision described as shameful considering the continued concerns of torture and ill treatment of political opponents. People were arrested in a, in, in a, in a, in a, in a suspicious manner, dubbed the kidnap. Secondly, people have been detained in non-gazetted places, whereas our laws provide for only detention in gazetted places and not more than 48 hours in detention unless such a person is producing courts of law if charged or suspected to have committed an offense. But we are seeing people who are arrested and detained forever. Democracy promotion is a key aspect of the United States mission and its foreign policy. It's worrisome whenever human rights are not respected, whether it's in Uganda, in neighboring countries, on the African continent, um, in the United States, and actually um, we're seeing this now with Russia's war on Ukraine, um, just the mass violation of citizens' rights. Uh, and again, there are many, many ways to protect um, those rights. It, they can be enshrined in law, but we have to uphold the law and we have to um, hold security forces and elected officials and those in executive positions. They have to be accountable when individuals' rights are violated. The U.S. mission in Uganda has been a growing partnership for the past 60 years and over time they are focusing on strengthening economic growth, health and education. U.S. mission in Uganda invests almost one billion U.S. dollar annually in Ugandan communities. We truly believe that we have a partnership with uh, with Uganda, that we see this as a long-term partnership. The first 60 years has been a, focused a lot on foreign assistance, on, on helping train um, and prepare and build a foundation for Uganda to continue to build on with the hopes that over time, Uganda will continue to, to improve um, in its economy and, and grow into middle and even advanced income status. And we can, our partnership will continue to change and evolve over, over the years. Uganda has uniquely been active in shaping regional security dynamics in Africa. The Uganda government has stood strong with the Western powers more so in the fight of terrorism and insecurity. Uganda is situated in a tough neighborhood um, and an instability in many of its neighbors driving refugees into the country. Um, it creates a number of challenges for Uganda and so um, Uganda's efforts to work with neighbors, to promote stability, to promote peace, to work together towards greater security that benefits everyone. Notice that over the weekend there was a meeting of the East African community just talking about these issues. So this is not something that Uganda, I, I don't believe, is going to be able to do alone. It's going to have to be in partnership with Rwanda, with DRC, with Kenya, with South Sudan, because these issues affect all of the countries in the neighborhood. This, as the U.S. mission released its sixth edition report to the Ugandan people and full potential of Uganda achieving its vision 24. Now, Valentine's Day is the busiest time of the year for the flower industry in Kenya, the fourth largest export of cut flowers in the world. Kenya's rose and carnation producers are also showing love to Mother Earth by shifting to solar power to fight climate change. Juma Wajanga reports from Nakuru, Kenya. 
It's a beehive of activity at Agriflora Kenya, a flower factory in Nakuru County, the heartland of Kenya's floriculture industry. It's almost Valentine's Day, the busiest time of the year for flower growers around the world. The cut flower industry generates hundreds of millions of dollars for Kenya each year, but the industry has been blamed for widespread pollution. The industry has been under a lot of scrutiny, both locally and internationally, and uh, we've had to deal with a lot of issues of environmental pollution, um, worker or human rights violations. Environmentalists say industries in Africa have the opportunity to go green. To focus on leveraging clean energy solutions, sun, hydro, geothermal. And when you look at the flower industry, especially in Kenya, yeah, it's actually getting into the space of clean energy. Kenya's flower producers say in recent years, they have been shifting to solar power for lights and equipment, in part to cut carbon emissions and fight climate change. By embracing solar, we are trying to control the emission of uh, carbon dioxide uh, from what we are doing uh, in the farm. So we've estimated by embracing solar uh, to be cutting down on uh, carbon dioxide emissions by about uh, 52 tons per, per month. That translates to about uh, 600 uh, tons of uh, carbon dioxide every, every year. Flower growers say solar power has also cut production costs. Our normal cost of power for our all uh, farms ranges between $90,000 to $100,000 a month. And now we are looking at uh, if you do 40%, we are saving an estimate of around $40,000 a month. Despite efforts to shift to solar power, private businesses like Agriflora say they cannot store all the power they can harness. Industry officials say that's because under current law, businesses are not allowed to store excess solar power on the national grid for future use. Environment experts say governments in Africa need to do more to incentivize and promote solar uptake. The fly industry that you mentioned, investing in clean energy and specifically solar, and making their full operation 100% solar needs to see what they're going to gain by moving away from their current operations to clean energy operations. The lower electricity costs from solar power would mean even bigger profits during peak periods like Valentine's Day. Valentine is very important in the flower calendar. It's a time when, of course, it's the time for love, but at the same time, it's a time for the growers to really make up for highest sales in the season. As consumers learn more about sustainability and climate change, environmentalists say flower growers, like other industries, will have even more incentive to go green. You see, Valentine's Day is important, but getting a flower is important. Thank you to Standard Media Group for giving everybody a flower on this special day. Now, after two years of online gatherings, the Wild Coffee Producers Forum has returned to an informat for 2023. The third Wild Coffee Producers Forum is convened in Kigali, Rwanda, with the aim to tackle and find solutions for critical issues faced by global coffee producers. The two-time conference is in Rwanda after one of the deliberations of the second edition of WCPF held in Capinas, Brazil. In 2019. The coffee subsector in Africa is still encumbered by a number of interrelated structural constraints along the value chain, especially those pertaining to low farm uh, level production and productivity lack of value addition infrastructure, access to affordable finance, and there are many more. The climate change has become one of the most significant challenges for coffee producers' prosperity. And therefore, uh, governments and all, police, uh, uh, and all stakeholders, even police-related bodies, 
needs to set up copying strategies aimed at limiting the adverse effects of the climate change on coffee uh, businesses. Food security of coffee farmers is important. If producers can't sustain food security, coffee farming may not continue as farmers use limited resources to feed their families first before they can look after coffee plants. We will continue advancing the producer's agenda as part of a broader value chain and the need to be part of the global actions for the prosperity of our producers, the future of our coffee, and the survival of our planet. Now let's take a short commercial break. We will be back with much more right here on Africa Speaks. I leave you with Destination Africa. KTN News. Get the whole story. of illness causing germs and COVID-19 in your home. Jake, your family's guardian against germs and COVID-19. In this special month of love, we celebrate love in all its forms and we're here to share the love with all of you. Love is a powerful thing. It brings people together, creates memories and makes the world a better place. The Standard Group PLC is excited to celebrate love with its audiences through their different brands. Share your love story in video or text to WhatsApp number 0793393252 before 12th of February for a chance to get a masquerade movie experience with your story published in The Standard. Yanapotokea kila mahali katika kila pembe ya Kenya. Tunahakikisha kuwa tuko pale kukupa dondo mubashara. Yomba anachomika gari ayo wisi ingia. Kiswa hili kitaendelea kubisi ingia yake. Hapa tulimpatia 86%. Majua zasa hapa tunakutia gold, hakuna kingine. Viko sivietu ya wanahabari viko kila mahali. Kuhakikisha kuwa hubitri na lolote na lofanyika. 
katika kaunti ya Taita Taita niko katika kituo moja wapo mocho usikose kutazama yanayojiri kila siku Jumatatu hadi Ijumaa Clement Masombo Tobias Chanji kwa kwangu Elvis Kosgi sina la ziada Upgrade your DSTV package to enjoy all the content you love. That means if you're on Access and you upgrade to Family, you get boosted to Compact. If you're on Family and you upgrade to Compact, you get boosted to Compact Plus. And if you're on Compact and you upgrade to Compact Plus, you get boosted all the way to Premium. Mars. Yani mko mtaani zubai just like that? It's time to play Insta Meter and you could win up to 10 million shillings instantly. The game is quite easy. Simply dial star 239 hash to play. Don't just zuba. Play Insta Meter today and get a chance to win millions. Over 18s only. Gaming is addictive. Play responsibly. This message has been authorized by the BCLB. License number 880. We value your feedback and welcome any comments, queries or complaints regarding our news content. You can get in touch with us on SMS 22155, call 0719012450 or email feedback at standardmedia.co.ke or you can send us a letter on Post Office Box 30080-00100. or deliver it to our offices at Standard Group Center Mombasa Road Nairobi KTN News Get the whole story Thank you for watching KTN News and welcome back to Africa Speaks. Now, in Senegal, President Macky Sall's brainchild, the city of the future, begins to take shape. Damiado will eventually house the various branches of government, the UN headquarters, universities and sports stadiums. But Titanic project requires huge workforce attracting migrants from all over the West Africa. Now those workers are alleging poor and even dangerous working conditions on various construction sites within the project. In the city of Diamniadio, about 40 kilometers from Dakar, the skeleton of a tower under construction looms over the city. In the middle of fields and herds of cows, buildings are emerging, stadiums, apartment blocks, and government offices. This project is the brainchild of President Macky Sall, who hopes to relieve the congestion of the capital and modernize the country. Workers from all over West Africa are bringing the project to life. From Guinea to Sierra Leone to Nigeria, laborers have poured into the city looking for work. The problem that we have in our country, uh, we don't have job facility in our country. Things is not easy in our country. That's why we are here to find our way, to find our living in Senegal. But when they arrived on this construction site, the workers were met with some extreme working conditions, often finding themselves working seven days a week, sometimes up to 13 hours a day, to earn as little as a few euros. Because if you wound, they will not take you, take care of you. Uh, the day you will not come to work, you don't have no money. They will not give you. They will not mark you for that particular day. You are not in that working place. Near this construction site, workers had been living in makeshift barracks built by their employer, a Chinese construction company. But most of those temporary shelters were demolished in November. These Guinean workers who were living in company barracks claimed that the cost of their upkeep was docked from their wages. Man. But there's the electricity, there's the water. All of that that comes out of our wages without the workers knowing about it, without anyone knowing whether it's from our salary. 
Since his living quarters were destroyed, the Sierra Leonean has been walking three hours a day to get to and from work. The only place he can afford to rent is this small room, which he shares with two friends in an unfinished building. But it's the only way he can afford to keep supporting his family back home. For the month, it's 90,000 news. 90,000, and I'm going to pay a rent house. Uh, I'm going to eat. Uh, I'm going to pay light bill, water facilities. I'm going to send money every month. And uh, the money that I will be reserving, which is uh, uh, 40,000, the 40,000, I send it for my family. Uh, to be sustained. After months of working in Diamniadio, this labourer from Sierra Leone describes the abuse he claims he endured. So like every day the Chinese people think like, just started working every day, shout, shout, hit you, abuse you. They hit me. They hit you, they, get, they hit you, they abuse you, so, it's not, so that's it. The developer of this construction project says that everything is done in strict compliance with the law and that no cases of abuse were reported to him. Madani Tal recalls one fatality due to an accident at a site where he claims that all necessary support was provided for the family. He believes the conditions the migrant workers face are not specific to Senegal. This is a global problem for which we must find sustainable solutions, because all this is due to poverty. When people leave home, it's because they don't have opportunities, they're in a crisis situation, or they come from countries in conflict. For many migrant workers, Senegal's so-called city of the future also represented hope for a better future for themselves. For some, at least on these construction sites, that hope has now turned... And the Kenyan court ruled that Meta can be sued in the country over alleged poor working conditions, while a deal looks set to create one of Africa's largest energy distribution companies. Here's a roundup of business news from Africa this week. Here are five business stories making headlines in sub-Saharan Africa this week. Malaysian state energy company Petronas is selling its 74% stake in South Africa's largest gas station chain, Engen, to Vivo Energy, the company said on Thursday. That'll create one of Africa's largest energy distribution companies, with over 3,900 service stations and more than 2 billion litres of storage capacity across 27 African countries. Also in South Africa, President Cyril Ramaphosa declared a national state of disaster, giving his government additional powers to tackle crippling outages by struggling state utility ESCOM. The crisis has progressively evolved to affect every part of society. However, the RAND was little changed on Friday as investors shrugged off the move, which one analyst's note described as too little too late. Nigeria's Supreme Court has suspended a Friday deadline for citizens to swap old banknotes for new ones. Nigerians were due to turn in old 1,000, 500 and 200 Naira banknotes, but have been complaining there are not enough of the newly designed notes available, causing chaotic scenes at banks. A labor court in Kenya has ruled that Meta, the parent company of Facebook, can be sued in the country. That's after a former content moderator filed a lawsuit alleging poor working conditions. Meta, which did not respond to a request for comment, had argued the court had no jurisdiction because the company is not based in Kenya. And finally, Botswana's mines minister has warned African governments to be wary of the risks created by rising global competition for the continent's minerals. World powers are seeking new sources of metals needed for the transition to a lower carbon economy. But in an interview, Lefoko Moagi said, whenever there is a rush, people take what they want and leave gaping holes in Africa. The United States has told its citizens to leave Russia immediately due to the war in Ukraine and the risk of wrongful detentions. The last such public warning came after Russian President Vladimir Putin ordered a partial mobilization. The United States has told its citizens to leave Russia immediately, citing the ongoing war in Ukraine and a risk of arbitrary arrest or harassment by Russian law enforcement agencies. The Kremlin said it was not the first time US citizens had been asked to leave Russia. 
The last such public warning was in September after President Vladimir Putin ordered a partial mobilization. The US Embassy in Moscow said in a statement, quote, Russian security services have arrested US citizens on spurious charges, singled out US citizens in Russia for detention and harassment, denied them fair and transparent treatment, and convicted them in secret trials or without presenting credible evidence. The Federal Security Service said in January that prosecutors had opened a criminal case against a United States citizen on suspicion of espionage. Last December, US basketball star Brittany Griner was released in a prisoner swap. She had been sentenced to nine years in a penal colony for possessing vape cartridges containing cannabis oil after a judicial process labeled a sham by Washington. Meanwhile, former US Marine Paul Whelan is serving a 16-year sentence in a Russian penal colony after being convicted of what Washington says are fictitious espionage charges. Neurosurgeon Mustafa al Yanim has not left the hospital where he works in Syria, Syria's Idlib for one week. The small hospital near the Bab al Hawa border with border crossing with Turkey is where many of the victims of last week's earthquakes have been taken. Neurosurgeon Mustafa al Yamani has not left the hospital where he works in Syria's Idlib for six days. The small hospital near the Bab al Hawa border crossing with Turkey is where many of the victims of last Monday's earthquakes have been taken. Here, he explains the difficult decisions he's had to make. On the day of the quake, I was on my day off, and after the disaster, there was a call put out for all doctors to head to hospitals, and I responded. I started working on Monday morning, the morning of the quake. Until today, six days, I've been at the hospital and worked around the clock. There are surgeries to be done, and I'm usually between operating rooms and doing the rounds with patients between 8 in the morning until around 2 a.m. There were a lot of very tough cases, one of which was a three-month-old baby who lost his entire family. He's the only survivor, and he was in a critical condition. We put him on a ventilator. He has other injuries to his chest, stomach and head. The majority of patients, thank God, have been treated well, but there are some who haven't and there is nothing we can do. Of course, the resources at our disposal were limited compared to the scale of the disaster. And in this area, in the rebel-held areas, we don't have the infrastructure or hospitals to receive such patient numbers. There are well-established countries that haven't been able to deal with such situations. At least 36,000 people are reported to have been killed, of which more than 4,300 are in northwest Syria. In Syria, the disaster hit hardest in the rebel-held northwest, leaving homeless yet again many people who had already been displaced several times by a decade-old civil war. Compared to government areas, the region has received over the past year of war, Russia has occupied and lost vast swaths of Ukraine, and it now appears to be attempting to retake some of the same territory. Families remaining in the areas under this fire say the losses have already suffered have been enormous. VOA's Heather Marduk reports from the Kherson Oblast in Ukraine. When it was occupied by Russia last year, this village, Pravdina, in the Kherson Oblast, was surrounded by the Ukrainian army and engaged in fierce fighting. The front line passed right here. The Russians stood here, all over the street. Much of the area has been destroyed or laden with mines, but Ukraine now controls the province. Dummies set up by Russian troops to scare Ukrainian forces now stand guard against no one. A reminder that on the ground, even high-tech war mostly consists of young men fighting to survive. Each side has attacked the airport multiple times. Both would rather see it in ruins than be useful to the enemy. 
Inside this provincial capital, street signs declare Kherson a hero city and say, family, you are free. Bombs still fall day and night, but most of the city still stands. Locals say the vast majority of residents fled long ago. Some escaped when Russia took over. Others left with the Russians when Ukraine took the city back. Russian forces are only a few kilometers away, and the people remaining say they have nowhere to go or they have been displaced from even more dangerous places. We have been here in Kherson for half a year and have only been to our home once. Now there is no road because the bridge was destroyed. Ignatenko is also from Pravdina, where most homes are empty or destroyed. There were many worse days here. We were fired upon many times. I fixed the windows over and over again before the house was destroyed. So there were many worse days here. The very worst day was when I saw Russian tanks entering the village. Now only remnants of Russian tanks remain in the village. But Sasanovich says that is little comfort when so much has been lost. And finally, Libyan officials attend the inauguration ceremony of a maritime line with Tunisia at the reopened Shuab seaport of Libya's capital Tripoli, which reused operations after several years of closure. Take a look at the launch of Libya's maritime line. That story from Libya is what brings Africa speaks to a close. My name is Dennis Asaito. Many thanks for watching and for everybody who made this a success. As and I leave you with the proverb of the day. TN News. Get the whole story.